Hey everybody, it's Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health. What's the future health? I am talking to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. And today we are diving in to the digital patient data privacy issues that are going to be popping up as a result of the Supreme Court's reversal on Roe versus Wade. And joining us to do that, we have my favorite data privacy and HIPAA expert, who's also the lead for data sharing and stewardship at Invite. Please welcome Devin McGraw. Devin, it's good to have you here. Thank you, Jessica. I'm glad to be here. All right, so Devin, we are going to have this conversation about Rose impact or the reversal of Rose impact on virtual care and digital health. And it's, it merits that I have to say that this is part of our special series sponsored by our friends at Wheel. So this is our virtual care regulatory roundup series. And Wheel is the health tech company who is powering the virtual care industry. And they provide companies with everything they need to launch and scale virtual care services, including the regulatory infrastructure to deliver high quality and compliant care. And so compliant care is going to be the issue of the day here. And so what I want to do for everybody here who's trying to understand, you know, how the Dobbs decision is going to impact their business is talk through exactly what's going to happen, how things have changed. And I want to leave them at the end, Devin, with some advice about what they should do from your perspective. I mean, this is what you do in your day job at Invitae. This is what you've done for your whole career, but we'll give them some good advice about what to do next. So why don't we kick the conversation off though? I'd love to hear from your perspective. You know, what did this decision do? in terms of you know, changing what virtual care and digital health companies, even those that are not in reproductive health, you know, what is it, what is this change? How does this change the landscape for us playing in this space? Well, I think it really shined a gigantic spotlight on the fact that we don't actually really have good data protections outside of HIPAA for health data that's collected by a whole host of kind of new digital health entities that are that are on the scene. And, and you know, data is a really important component of digital health, right? You just, it's, it's very rare that you're getting a digital health service that doesn't involve the collection of your data in some way, shape or form. And, you know, some of these entities will be covered by HIPAA and we can leave to the side for a moment whether HIPAA is even sufficient to, to protect against, you know, disclosure of health information. But we have, we've always had this kind of, um, bifurcated approach to regulating health data, where we've got, you know, the HIPAA side, and then you've got the side that isn't covered by HIPAA, and where people are protected more or less by, well, maybe they live in a state that's enacted some state protections that would be true if you're in California or Virginia, um, or you've got, you know, what are the commitments that the company is making to you about how they're going to protect the data. What I think is the most consequential about the Dobbs decision and access to data is the criminal aspect of this, the criminal and civil responsibility that for these state laws, which ordinarily if Roe had been in place, many of them would not have been allowed to be in place because there's no longer a constitutional guarantee around choice, you, states can regulate it. I mean, Supreme Court basically said this was intended to be something that would that the legislature would have a say in. And if the states want to regulate it, then they can regulate it in the way that they want to. And so consequently, a number of states had trigger laws on the books or already had laws on the books or are currently crafting laws that not only would outlaw abortion, but would also criminalize the, the, the getting of an abortion or the performing of an abortion, which makes the very data that we have kind of underprotected all along now subject to being weaponized against people, which is not something that we have seen before. We've always, you know, those of us in the privacy space have been worried for a long time about, oh, you know, we don't have comprehensive protections for data that is outside of HIPAA. Now, you know, th this is this this really ratchets that concern up to the stratosphere because the failure to protect that data means that someone could go to jail. Yeah. So Devin, like, like I and, and I want to ask you about like a before versus after here. You know, it's like there, you had said, you know, like there were some things that were not ideal about the way that we in in virtual care and digital health were handling data from a privacy and protection standpoint 
before and now that that there's this possibility that it's like you know we could really you know cause ourselves some trouble here so but you know can you elaborate then on a little bit more and i know you've written extensively about this about you know like the, about health data and, and and thinking about privacy particularly in these health tech companies that like you said at the beginning you know their job is to collect data a lot of them that's what they're there for is is like the the data piece of this is a core part of their business so you know even before you know the dobbs decision and even before you know where we're at now with you know with the different types of state abortion laws that are triggering different laws that are now in place what what was the other like what were some of the other issues before for you you know i mean especially from your hipaa background you know and, and all the things that you've done in terms of, of providing you know the right framework for data um good data stewardship and patient advocacy and protecting patients rights to privacy you know what were some of the things you've concerned about before when it came to virtual care and digital health companies and the way they were collecting data like give me like the hot list <laughs> the hot list of the worst offenses <laughs> well well it you know look a lot of a lot of digital health a lot of the business model isn't necessarily in or at least not completely in the delivery of the digital service itself but there's often a data play associated with a lot of them. Um, and, and there is this sort of, um, with some companies, this like, well, if we can grab the data and more, right, and come, you know, sort of combine the data that we're getting from whatever is the app or the service we're providing to the individual with other data that we can, we can purchase or glean from other, you know, people's shopping and other habits, then we can create data profiles on people that we, that we can sell. And that can be, you know, kind of another component of what we do. And a lot of that is not at all transparent to individuals when they sign up for the service. And given yeah. that, that that's the lead, that's the, at least at the federal level, at the national level, that's kind of the regulatory environment that we have set up for non-HIPAA covered entities where health data is concerned. It's like, well, what kind of commitments are you making to people and what are the terms of service? And nobody reads those because they're usually really long. And, 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 and frankly, even for companies that have tried to do a better job of making those policies a little bit more understandable, it's still pages and pages long. And you know, for most folks, there's, you know, there's a good or a service that they're trying to get and, it, and they're not interested in you know reading seven pages of legal copy yeah. in order to download the service and and so you think about and 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 that's assuming that people are sort of using an app or service there's a lot of other information that kind of digital dust from people's interactions on the internet that gets collected and used in ways that people have really can't control for the most part or that is hard for them to control and that that um, you know can result in people feeling you know sort of stalked in their private lives by 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 their online activities you know i mean how many of us who you know we get online and all of a sudden we're sort of faced with an ad that and you're wondering like how the heck did they know like it, it, it that i was on that drug or that i just talked to my doctor yesterday about this very problem like how is it possible for them to know this are they can they are they eavesdropping on my phone not likely, but there's several other breadcrumbs that you have left of that trail as a, as a sort of online, you know, a person who lives at least part of their life online that gets part of what gets collected. And it's all just, again, unless you happen to live in a state that's enacted a stronger law, it's all just regulated by what kind of commitments they're making. And it's a very much a buyer beware set of circumstances. Like, if you're really going to populate your data here, if you're going to sign up for that discount card, if you're going to download that app, if you're going to start searching for something on the web that has to do with a health condition, chances are you're going to get tracked on it. And that creates a climate for people who have strong privacy sensitivities of, I'm, I'm not going to use that. I'm not going to use some of these telehealth innovations. I'm not going to yeah. use digital health. I'm not going to use that app. I'm not going to search online to try to find a community that might help me understand what's going on with this disease that I have, where I can get peer support. Like if I can't, you just don't have the same kind of guarantees and it's unfortunate. I think it sets, it sets the industry back to not have sort of a baseline set of rules that everyone plays by because when you know, certainly there are companies that are trying to rise to the top and be better. Certainly before I was at Citizen, that was not covered by HIPAA. We, 
worked very hard, I think, to make our policies be very consumer friendly, be very trustworthy. Um, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter, of course, for companies to try to do their best. But when, when there's so many other tools and apps and services out there that are, um, you know, just really trying to maximize their return versus thinking about these trust issues, it does have a tendency to spoil it for everybody else as people, somebody has a bad experience and then, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uploading my data in any app. I don't trust them. And, and that's the end of the story. So, so I want to ask about HIPAA. Because like yeah. you just said, like there's like no baseline set of standards. And I think like everybody's kind of looked at HIPAA as like the baseline set of standards, but it's like, and, and I think at this time too, Devin, like clue people in on your background, you know, particularly in this arena, because it's like, you've been involved for a long time, you know, with, with HIPAA in particular. And it's like, I'm, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are now. Cause I mean, HIPAA was passed in the late nineties, right? Am I right on that? Late nineties, it was 99 ish, right around there. And that was before any of this digital health stuff even existed. So it's like, are we expecting too much of HIPAA right now, this many years later? Or it, or is, is it still, is, is there still like a, a, a base of it that's good, but it needed to be added on? Like, I would love, De Devin, give me your thoughts on HIPAA. Are we expecting too much? What do you think? Well, so, so just in terms of my own background on HIPAA, I actually was the deputy director of the HIPAA office at HHS for close to three years. Uh, beginning in the Obama administration and coming into the Trump administration. So uh, I have a very mixed um, set of thoughts about this. So, and, and, they, and they've certainly changed a lot since the Dobbs Supreme Court ruling. So I have long said that HIPAA has actually stood up amazingly well for being a set of regulations that were initially enacted in 1999. The statute was 96, but really the meat of the, of the, of the protections and the obligations is in regulation. And that didn't happen until late 90s, late uh, 1999. So um, it works, it still works amazingly well for the limited entities that it covers. It was never intended to be this sort of broad health privacy statute. So, so we're sort of like, is it falling down on the job on protecting health data? Yeah, in a big way, but it was never intended to cover all health data in all places. And so it's, it, it's not HIPAA's fault <laughs> that it's falling short of, of the sort of promise of health privacy protection because it was kind of never intended to be the sort of be all and end all of health privacy. It was intended to regulate health plans and healthcare providers and the transactions that they do be, you know, between the two of them and the health data that they collect in the traditional healthcare ecosystem and the vendors that work with them and perform functions on their behalf. Like it's, a, it's, a, it's an ecosystem that seemed like that's where all the health data was back in 1999. You know, now today you could make the argument that most really health and, and what I call um, health relevant data, right? Data that isn't necessarily, doesn't look like health on its face, but it can be used to make decisions about me, like my education level and where I live and my income might actually be pretty predictive of whether I'm gonna take a medication. Mm -hmm. And that's not health data, but it becomes used as health data. And so there's just a sea of that data, all my internet searches that I've ever done all the COVID searches that I did over the past two and a half years, right? None of that is, is protected. So HIPAA, HIPAA looks bad from that regard. So I've just historically said, yes, HIPAA needs, needs work to be upgraded. And part of that is about like, what we really need is a health data privacy law. We need a privacy law period because other personal data isn't covered either, but we do need um, protections for health data. And then the Dobbs decision had me going back to HIPAA and finding out that, oh, you know what? There's actually a bunch of loopholes in this law for law enforcement access Ooh. that um, that could be closed. Um, and not just, you know, and really I think for any time when the purpose of getting health information is to use it to weaponize it against somebody, right? And that's, you know, that's a level of health data use that goes beyond marketing goes beyond, you know, some of the things that we see on a daily basis. It happens with people's health data. This is not to minimize that that's people sort of feeling like they're being spied on 
and and with respect to health data that that is a problem i'm not suggesting that it's not but we we really jumped the shark in terms of like what the consequences are of health data falling into the hands of people who who intend to use it in order to pursue a criminal case either against a, a woman or a man seeking a service depending on the context um, or the provider that performed the service yeah, and that does take it to the next level. So what do you think, like, we should, like, if you were to make a recommendation, I mean, based on your experience, it's like, we need a, you said we need a health data or a data privacy law. Is this like the, the same kind of stuff that, you know, we're hearing more broadly where people are talking about, you know, stopping big tech and prevent, like, you know, protecting, protecting ourselves from big tech more broadly, or do you think it needs to have more of a health related focus? Are those two things different in your mind? I do think they're different. Um, I, yes, we need privacy protections for all kinds of data, but I think health data is a, is a bit different. And one of the reasons why it's different is because it's got so much value for changing how we get healthcare yeah. in, in this country, right? We, we don't just have a privacy problem. We have a healthcare problem. We have a healthcare delivery problem. We have a problem with costs. We have a problem with access. We have a problem with disparities. Data helps us fix that. Digital health should help us fix that. So if we're not sort of cognizant of regulating the data, but also making sure it can still be used, like that, that type of data, like that's not true of data about, you know, how much gas I put in my car. Yeah. That's not true of data about like, you know, how often I, um, you know, how many maybe steps I took, that's health data too. But you can think of sort of a bunch of generic personal data that, that might be collected and used to advertise to me or, or you know, many other things, but isn't going to, isn't sort of the kind of data that might make a difference in the kind of care that's delivered to me personally, as well as to, you know, people like me or help us to control costs in the healthcare system. We have other goals that we need to meet. So, so that to me has always meant when you're regulating health and health related data, you have to do so with an eye toward incentivizing the good while you minimize or disallow the bad. And that's, that's kind of a, a harder calculus to make than just, oh, we just need to think about the privacy. We just need to privacy. Do you think that's where we're headed? Like if you were to take out your crystal ball, I mean, and we're sitting here, it's like the, the beginning of August, 2022. I mean, we're sitting here, so things are very much up in the air still with all of this stuff, especially with it, with the overturning of Roe versus Wade and what this means and what, what's happening state by state as far as these different laws are concerned. You know, and so I'm curious, so like I, I, pre I predict the future for us, Devin, we won't hold you to it, but it's like, what do you think is gonna happen next? Like in terms of, you know, as far as like, so so our, our folks who are watching who are running these businesses if you were going to make a best guess based on what you know about working in the government what you know about hipaa what you know about data privacy and stewardship in your current job at invitae you know what are you guys kind of doing to kind of hedge your bets against what's going to come down the pike like what do you think is going to happen next from a regulatory standpoint what do you think well i do think that the administration will take steps to tighten up hipaa to minimize to those loopholes or yeah to minimize the opportunities to weaponize data against people or healthcare providers okay um they have a way to do that again I, as i said earlier most of the rules and the guardrails that are in hipaa today are creatures of regulation which means they can be changed they can't they they you know you have to go through the process of public comment and taking consideration of comments, but you can change them without having to get permission from Congress to do so. Okay. So I, I think for sure that, that, that we will see some tightening of HIPAA that occurs. I mean, we've already seen the administration taking some steps to use some of its other powers, the power of the purse around, you know, insisting that women be able to receive the full spectrum of pregnancy related care. Um, for anybody who's a Medicare provider, that's under the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. That's, you know, so, so I think they're, they're trying to be very um, um, broad in sort of looking at the ways that the healthcare system and, you know, how we both regulate data and how services are delivered to make sure that the full spectrum of care that people deserve can actually be delivered without subjecting them to 
at, at least putting some constraints on how the data can flow before they're subjected to penalties at a state level. So I think that will happen for sure. Okay, so back to that. I wanna bring this conversation like full circle and I wanna come back around and end it with your advice on what digital health and virtual care companies should do like, like legit today as we're facing like all the different fallout from the Dobbs decision that, that overturned Roe versus Wade. So it's like, and all of the data privacy things that we've discussed up until this point, how that really impacts their businesses. You know, it's like, if you were to give your best advice to like, you know, the data privacy team, like you're doing this in your day job now, Devin, like you're, you're one of us. And so it's like, what, what, what questions are you asking yourself about like the way that Invite collects data or the way that you're using data? I mean, how are you challenging your dev team? Like, what are the things that should be on, uh, on a virtual care company's radar are when it comes to data privacy, security, and preparing kind of for what's next in terms of the fallout from all of this? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a number of things to pay attention to. Um, one, but, but the first thing I would say is be part of this conversation. Like, recognize that this is a threat, that this is a threat to your business, and this is a threat to digital health and to be actively part of the solution as opposed to thinking that, oh, somebody else will figure this out, right? And, and the reason why I say this is because it could be a very long time before we would get federal legislation, notwithstanding how far the ADPPA has progressed. There might be more states that jump into the, into the, into the mix if we don't get federal action. Uh, I think that's likely, but it will it will not be all states. It will be, you know, it'll divide itself up in the same way that, you know, the reproductive health law landscape looks today, right? Yeah. With some states providing a lot of protection and some states providing no. So it's going to be up to these companies to take steps that protect their users. And what steps are those? That's where I think there's some some evolving uh, understanding of that and lots of discussion going discussion groups happening. You know, we definitely saw some of the fertility apps talking about how to make an anonymous option available yeah. for their users. That is a great first step as long as the steps that they are taking to keep people anonymous really do keep them anonymous. Right. Is it still possible for someone to look at user X, Y, Z and figure out that that's Devin McGraw? Yeah, the combination of other data that's that's floating around out on the internet. There's going to be a limit to how much can be done here. Um, as long as there is the ability for a state law to be passed that requires the disclosure of data and could be turned into a court order from a state court in one of those states, it's going to be very difficult for these companies to say no to that. You know, I would hope that they would fight it as much as they could before turning over that data. Cause I don't wanna tell people don't use those apps. Don't put that kind of data in an app, write it in a paper, write it down in a diary and stick it under your mattress. <laughs> like that's where we are. I mean, that's how ridiculous this is. It is, it is very ridiculous. And it's like, yeah, it's like, I appreciate you, you know, taking the time to talk with us because it's really important for, I think not, not even just the reproductive health or the women's health apps to understand like what's going on with this data, but it's like in case this starts to bleed over into other aspects of health. And the other thing I always think people forget about women's health, it's like no matter what kind of doctor's appointment you go to as a woman, one of the first three things they ask you is what was the first day of your last period? So, okay, yep. great. So, okay, great. I right now, anything primary care, like yeah. anything that's like always what they ask you. So, I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this falls out, but I really appreciate you taking the time and kind of giving us your insight on where things are at right now and, and how people in, who are in virtual care and digital health companies can kind of maybe think about what to do next and think about what's coming down the pike and where some of those limitations are that excellent. Thank you, HIPAA scholar for educating us on like where those loopholes were. No, truly, I think that that's really important. So thank you, Devin. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right, guys. Well, you can catch more from this virtual care regulatory roundup sponsored by Wheel over on my YouTube channel. It is youtube.com slash WTF Health. Like, again, we are talking to different experts about all the stuff that's kind of changing, and there's a lot changing in the macro environment around our virtual care and digital health businesses. And so we're trying to make sense of this stuff one month at a time. So tune in there, and you can also find all those other great interviews with the health tech who's who that I've got over there. Um, and you can learn a little bit more about the way that some of these companies are trying to change the way that we 
do healthcare in the face of everything that's coming against us. All right, Devin, thanks again for your time. I'm Jessica DeMasa. We'll talk to you guys real soon. Take care.